Africa CDC Pathogen Genomics Initiative uh, webinar, uh, the series that happens every uh, before we begin, I'd just like to notify you that the presentation will be recorded and the link will be shared after the presentation. Also note that we are live on Twitter, uh, the Africa CDC Twitter page and uh, Facebook and YouTube as well. And I'd like to ask you to post uh, your questions on the Q&A panel. Uh, so today's topic, as you might have seen from the flyer, is uh, entitled From Promise to Practice uh, Phylogenetics in and Beyond the Pandemic. And it will be delivered by Dr. Emma Hodcraft. So Dr. Hodcraft is a molecular epidemiologist at the Institute for Social and Preventative Medicine at the University of Bern. And Dr. Hodcraft's research focuses on the phylogenetics of viruses and other pathogens, mapping the spread and evolution of different genetic variants. So it gives me very uh, great much pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Emma uh, Hodcraft. Dr. Emma. Over to you. So thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to speak. And it's wonderful to have so many people I can already see in the chat that there's lots of people chiming in from all over the world. So that's really fantastic. So as was already introduced so kindly by Sarah, Today, I'm going to talk about From Promise to Practice, Phylogenetics in and Beyond the Pandemic. And this is a little bit of talk in two parts. So first, looking at kind of what sequencing has done in the pandemic, and then trying to, and, and where we are in the pandemic, what that might mean for the future of the pandemic, but then trying to look a little bit more generally at what we've gotten out of this pandemic, perhaps in some unexpected ways, and how we can make sure that we carry that forward, and most importantly, improve upon that for the future. So with that, um, I'm sure that it's not very controversial to open by saying that sequencing has been really key in this pandemic. We've seen an absolute revolution, both in data generation and also in data sharing. And I just want to put that, I think I, I say this a lot, certainly I say it a lot, I think others say it a lot, but I also want to put that into perspective. So just to graph that out, we now have this graph is actually a few weeks old, which in the world of the pandemic, of course, means totally out of date. So we actually now have over 9 million sequences of SARS-CoV-2 on GISAID. There are almost half a million more on GenBank and some more that are shared on other websites like COG UK. This is a mind blowing number of sequences. Um, and even though I think these numbers can be at this point, we're so used to talking about millions of sequences when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, it's worth remembering where we've come from. So at a rough estimate, if you look at other pathogens and how, how well we sequence those in the past, we estimate maybe a million genomes for HIV. So these are hard to count up because due to concerns about criminal prosecutions, these are not publicly available and they're stored in databases around the world. And very importantly, these are not full genomes. They're usually just partial HIV genomes. And after that, we estimate we have about 300,000 um, influenza sequences from around the world. And it really drops off even more sharply after that. For a lot of viruses out there, we have only hundreds or thousands of sequences. So what we've done in only two years, or a little over two years with SARS-CoV-2, is really incredible when it comes to the amount of data that's been generated and shared. And the way that we use this data, at least in my field of molecular epidemiology, is that we know that as a pathogen moves through a population and transmits from person to person, it will have these mutations shown here as these colored diamonds. Importantly, a lot of these will not change how the virus works, but of course some of them will. But the reason that we can make use of them is that when we then sequence samples that are taken from people, we can see these changes, these mutations in the genome and use them to start comparing which samples are more closely related that share mutations and which are more distantly related. And this allows us, sorry, this allows us to reconstruct a phylogenetic tree or a viral family tree that is kind of an approximation of this transmission history and allows us to see not only how the virus has changed over time in mutations, other viruses that are circulating, and of course, where and when it's kind of changed the world as it's spread. And of course, this is one of the key things this has allowed us to do, what gets a lot of talk at the moment, is to identify and track variants. So this is not a complete representation of all of the spike mutations from the variants of concern, but it gives a bit of a, a visual picture of how every variant, those of concern, but also those of interest, or just lineages that we're paying attention to this, has a unique sensation. It means that when a new sequence comes in, we can look at the mutations that it has, 
and very classified as an variant or a new sequence that we might just take a closer look at, or the tail end of perhaps whatever the last variant circulating was. And this has meant, of course, not only identifying sequences that are coming in today, but also has allowed us to track how these variants have spread around the world in really real time. So for example, from the first variant of Alpha in early 2021 to Beta in South Africa and Gamma in South America to Delta, which of course really became super prominent and seemed to push out all other variants. And then finally to Omicron, which is now increasingly growing dominant, is already dominant in many countries around the world and is very quickly becoming dominant globally. But there are lots of mutations that we can see in SARS-CoV-2. And so how do we decide when a particular new set of mutations or cluster of sequences is something that we actually call a variant or something that we want to pay a little more close attention to? Well, historically, what we've often looked for is a change in epidemiological parameters. So, for example, cases going up in a particular region, particular city or particular country. But it's very important, of course, to keep in mind that cases can change for many reasons. For example, changes in restrictions or changes in behavior or seasonality. And in Europe, we actually saw this illustrated at, in the autumn of 2021. Delta was already in Europe, but we still saw a wave as the temperatures grew colder, probably caused by seasonality, maybe a little bit of restriction change led to a Delta wave, even though Delta was already the dominant variant. So it wasn't due to a new variant. So it's very important to pick out that these things are not always associated with a mutation, which is why the next thing that we look for is, of course, some unique mutations that might be responsible for some epidemiological changes we're observing. And in particular, when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, we're often looking for mutations in spite. Though there's growing interest and knowledge about the mutations that we see in other regions of the genome. But in particular, what we're really looking for is to ask the question, are the viral changes that we observe causing a significant impact on these epidemiological parameters like transmission, immune evasion or vaccine efficacy, and clinical outcome? But on top of that, we also want to look at things like, is the variant expanding? Do we actually see that this variant is growing week on week? Is it spreading? So do we just see it in one town or one country? Or is it able to make inroads into other countries? And also, is it outcompeting other variants? So do we just see this somewhere where cases are very low and there's almost nothing else around? Or do we see that it is pushing out other variants when it comes into contact with them? And these are important because we have identified lineages and, and kind of clusters of sequences in the past that have had concerning mutations or that may have even seemed to be doing some of these things in one region or one country, but that don't seem to spread widely. And even though these variants can still be scientifically, of course, very interesting, and they can still be, of course, of concern to the places they're impacting, if it's just a small number of people affected, these are probably not going to be the variants that we go on to call the variants of concern and the change our kind of global approach to the pandemic. So all of this has meant that we have really an unprecedented real-time view of what's been happening in the pandemic, kind of from the beginning. But I also wanted to give a little bit of a brief overview of what this has allowed us to do today. So in particular, I think that means talking a little bit about the most recent concern, Omicron, that has been in the headlines quite a bit since it was discovered in late 2021, and as it has started to really start dominating across the world in 2022. And we can see this quite clearly by looking at a, a, a little bit of a graph showing how different variants have come and gone over time. And even though just these two are labeled as Delta, actually this is Delta as well. And Delta really was the absolute dominant variant for a lot of 2021. At some points, 98% of the sequences that we were getting globally or that were being submitted globally were Delta. So it's really seemed like Delta had managed to push out almost every other variant. Of course, Omicron then appeared a little bit out of left field, and since then it has gone on to sweep um, quite successfully around the world and very successfully push out Delta. Not completely yet, but the patterns that we're seeing suggest that it is also going to become incredibly dominant. Now, one thing that people have probably heard about Omicron is that one of its distinctions is that it sits on this really long branch. So this is the kind of ancestral sequence of COVID-2, and we can see different variants and different clades of the virus coming out from that middle. And in general, we do have branches that are a little bit long, leading to other variants of concern. 
but even though some of them don't show in this picture, often do have samples along these branches, kind of pre-variants. So we can see a little bit how a variant formed, how it accumulated those mutations. And also we can see where it was circulating before it really became, you know, the set of mutations that we now call that variant. But for Omicron, this branch really is just as long and naked as it looks here. So we don't have a lot of information to help us know how this, this variant, which is of course quite unique in many ways that I'll cover in a minute, how it evolved. There are, of course, some theories about this, that it may have circulated in immunocompromised individuals, that perhaps it was circulating where it was simply undetected. Unfortunately, we don't have even coverage for molecular surveillance around the world, or they have been circulating for a while in animal reservoir. And very importantly, it could also be a combination of two or more of these things. And the reason in particular that immunocompromised individuals or animal reservoirs have come up is because this may have been a way for the virus to accumulate more mutations in a shorter amount of time, which of course might explain why we don't see kind of intermediate samples, or these might have been much easier to miss, particularly if combined with undetected circulation. One of the things that makes Omicron really quite unique is that it has far more mutations in a particular region of, of the virus called S1 than we've seen in any other variant. So S1 is the top part of the spike protein. This is the spike protein here. And the top part of that is called S1, the bottom part is S2, and the top part is particularly one of importance because it has the receptor binding domain shown here in purple, and that's what the virus uses to bind to cells. It's also very important for our immune system to actually recognize the virus. And the N-terminal domain, which is this kind of shoulder here, that's also really important for immune recognition. We also know that mutations at what we call the S1, S2 boundary, so where the, the S1 and the S2 sections kind of meet, these can also be very important. And when we look at this, at this chart, it's essentially the x-axis is when sequences were taken, and the y-axis is the number of S1 mutations. This is all of the rest of SARS-CoV-2 on here, and this is Omicron. So it really does stand well and above out from everything that we've seen before, which of course has raised some questions about how, even from when it was first detected, really what raised the alert about Omicron before we'd seen any epidemiological effects was concerns about what this number of mutations might mean for how the virus behaves. And we now know, of course, that Omicron does behave differently from other variants we've seen in the past. But one thing I've glossed over a little bit so far is, of course, that Omicron is a little bit more complex than just Omicron. And we, I think this is coming more well-known now, but of course, Omicron is actually a family of viruses that are all by the, the ancestor of SARS-CoV-2. So BA1 is the lineage that was first detected. So if you heard about Omicron in November, December, early January, this was generally the BA people were talking about. This was the first one to be detected and the one that really swept around first. Then BA2 is a kind of a sister to BA1. And this is the one that I think has been in, at least in Europe and in North America, in a lot of headlines lately. Because BA2, even though we did actually pick up the first sequences of it, of it not long after BA1, it didn't do anything for a while. It didn't seem like it was expanding. And then all of a sudden, particularly in 2022, the beginning of this year, it's taken off quite a bit. Particularly, we started to see it spread in Scandinavian and other countries, but it's now becoming really widespread and pushing out BA1 around much of the world. And then finally, we have BA3. This is the kind of uh, uh, neglected sister. Um, we picked up BA3 not long after the other two, but it hasn't seemed like it's grown very much at all. So this is one that you don't hear much about because there isn't too much to say about it. And one thing I just want to emphasize is that BA1 and BA2, even though they're both Omicron and they're part of this family, you can see the number of mutations here on the x-axis, and these are really quite distinct. So they are you know, very separate variants um, that, that potentially have slightly different properties, and they are very distinct from each other. And we can visualize this in another way by looking at the difference between BA1 and BA2. In looking for, at some great um, graphics from outbreak.info, where here it's showing for the BA2 and BA1 lineages a mutation in different genes. And then if they have that mutation, it's purple. If they don't, it's white. So where they both have purple, that means they both have that mutation. And we can see that in some genes like ORF1A ORF and ORF1B, they have some similarities and some differences. But of course, with SARS-CoV-2, what we're often really interested in is the S terminal, or sorry, the S, the S protein spike. And here I've, I've uh, 
marked the different regions of spikes. So we have the N-terminal domain, the receptor binding domain, and the S1, S2 boundary. And what's particularly interesting here is that if you look at this end of spike, you can see that actually they share a lot of mutations. So there's a lot of places where we have two purple blocks. But if we look at this end of spike, you can see there are a number of differences. So we see where one has the mutation and the other doesn't. And this is particularly interesting because, of course, this end is where the N-terminal domain is, and at least part of that receptor binding domain is, both of which are very important for immune recognition. And so this does raise some questions about how similar these two are, particularly in terms of immune recognition. And of course, knowing about these mutations, seeing this concerning jump in the S1 mutations and these no other mutations in areas we know are important, meant that people really started looking into the difference between Omicron and everything else and the difference between BA1 and BA2 quite, quite soon found. So in particular, people started doing things like looking at mission studies. And this is a, a very nice study from Denmark that shows the secondary attack rate. That's essentially, if you get infected, how many other people do you infect? It's kind of a measure of this for Delta in, in purple at the bottom, then for BA1 in blue and for BA2 in red. And here this shows very nicely that BA1 does seem to be more transmissible than Delta and BA2 seems to, again, be more transmissible than BA1. And this might help to explain recently where BA1 at least, uh, at least partially responsible for the fact that BA1 has so successfully displaced Delta and that BA2 is now quite successfully pushing out its sister BA1. And this has also been confirmed with data from the UK that's looked at kind of the time difference between when one person is infected and when the next person gets infected. This seems to have become shorter from Delta to BA1 and shorter again from BA1 to BA2. But of course, one of the big questions with Omicron has been about immune escape. We have all of these mutations in those critical parts of spike that allow our body to recognize it. And we saw in some of these early uh, papers that came out where, again, they say Omicron here, in this case, that means BA1, the difference in how well vaccines, uh, uh, immune, sorry, how well antibodies elicited by vaccines seem to work against different variants. And Omicron seem to unfortunately be much less able to be neutralized by people who've been vaccinated than Delta or wild type. Though thankfully this is recovered with the booster dose, which is why booster doses became such a feature um, in this winter and early spring. But of course the question remained, are BA1 and BA2 the same in this regard? And thankfully it seems like largely the answer is yes. So this is a very similar study looking at neutralization, but here they've separated out BA1 and BA2 and you can see that before boosting, it's similarly fairly low, but thankfully after boosting, it's, a, it's about the same for BA1 and BA2. And also we've got data, some early data that suggests that these are people who've been infected with BA1. They're also vaccinated, except for this person. And getting BA1 not only seems to give you very good titers against BA1, but also against BA2. There might be, there is small differences here between BA1 and BA2, but it's very, very hard to say whether these are significant in terms of what these actually come to, you know, for your risk of getting infected or your risk of having severe outcomes, these are pretty small. So we would suggest they want to be able to decide that they have a few different mutations, generally seem to be somewhat similar in terms of patient and how well the virus, the, the vaccine can protect us. And finally, the last thing um, that has been very important that we've learned about Omicron is that it does seem to have a lower hospitalization risk. So it does seem to have a less severe outcomes. Um, when compared to Delta. Now, one really important caveat here is that, yes, this is real, even if you control for vaccination, but it does not necessarily mean that Omicron is mild. And we can see this right now if we compare the difference in, in impact that Omicron has had in different countries around the world. So the Omicron wave in Switzerland, for example, where we're very lucky to have good vaccination rates, especially in our vulnerable population and elderly population, Omicron did not cause a big surge in hospital cases here in Switzerland. If you look at the situation in Hong Kong, on the other hand, they're having really overwhelmed hospitals due to their Omicron wave. It's not a different variant, but they unfortunately have much lower vaccination rates, particularly in those really vulnerable groups. So it's very important to keep in mind, Omicron is not, it's not mild. It's not something that you can just stop worrying about without vaccine. Even if it is milder, vaccines are still really critically important for, for protecting people from those bad outcomes. But of course, all of this really um, 
is a reminder with, with what we've seen with Omicron that what we're trying to do in this pandemic so often is to predict really complex outcomes, to predict whether a variant of concern is going to, or to predict whether a new variant is going to be a variant of concern and whether it will have changes in things that really might influence how we're handling the pandemic. And we're trying to do that with unprecedented amounts of data. It's fantastic we have so much data, but it is a huge volume to work through. And of course, at a pace that is also unprecedented. Normally, scientific uh, advances work. Of course, we're always trying to do things as quickly as we can, but it's not unusual that you might work on something and publish a year later. Of course, in a pandemic, we need information much faster than that. And we have, of course, with this you know, new pathogen, something that is different from what we've seen before. So for example, no variant of concern yet has come from another variant. So a very kind of schematic representation of the phylogeny of, um, of SARS-CoV-2, and I've highlighted the variants of concern in red. And you can see that none of these have come from another variant of concern, which is a reminder that they have thrown a lot at us that we perhaps did not expect and that we don't necessarily know where the next variant of concern might come from. A lot of people, myself included, felt sure that with the dominance of Delta, the next variant of concern would be a child of Delta. Instead, it was Omicron. Now it seems not impossible, perhaps quite likely, that the next variant of concern could come from Omicron. But we have to keep in mind it could come from somewhere else in the tree. And this is also reflected really well if we look at things like antigenic um, pr projections. So if we look at kind of how similar in antigenic properties different variants are, we have um, alpha here in the middle, we have delta over here, we have beta and gamma over here, but Omicron BA1 and BA2 are really quite far away from other variants that we've seen previously. And again, this is a reminder that we don't necessarily know where in antigenic space future variants might go. It's very possible that they, you know, maybe this is some of the largest jumps that SARS-CoV-2 could do, at least in one big movement as it did with Omicron. But on the other hand, there is perhaps still room where other variants in the future might move away from the um, antigenic variety that we've seen before, and that could impact our immunity and our vaccines. And a lot of this is due to the stage that SARS-CoV-2 kind of is in as a virus. It's, it's a pandemic virus. It's very new to our population. And you can compare this by looking at what we see with a long-term endemic um, virus. For example, here I've got- Recording in progress a 12-year tree of seasonal influenza. And this shows very clearly what we call ladder-like evolution. I always think it looks a little bit more like a set of stairs. But this, this very distinct pattern where over time, you can see that the virus is kind of evolving very slightly. And this is generally caused by antigenic evolution. So the virus is quite well adapted. It doesn't have large jumps to make, but it will change its epitopes. It changes the outside of the virus a little bit so that it can keep reinfecting us year after year after year, as of course we know happens with flu. Now, of course it can make larger jumps. This is one of the ways we get things like pandemic flu, but when it comes to seasonal flu, it has this very ladder-like stair-step um, evolution. And while this doesn't mean that it's perfectly predictable, it's certainly not, or else we would have wonderful flu vaccines. It does mean that we have some idea of where the next flu, flu lineages that will circulate will come from. So for example, though we may not be able to say exactly which of these will circulate next, we can generally say that it's probably one or at least partially, you know, maybe some from down here, but in general, one of these guys up here. And that means that we have some idea for how the virus might change and what might circulate next. With SARS-CoV-2, it's a completely different vector. So of course, the time scale is different. This is much shorter but we really see what we might call much more bursting evolution, where SARS-CoV-2, we don't see this stair-step pattern at all. As I showed in the other slide, the variants of concern have all come from very different parts of the tree, not from what was circulating previously. And this makes it much harder for us to predict what might come next, because SARS-CoV-2 has um, potentially more exploration to do. It has ways that it can find to better adapt to transmitting or to entering cells or different cell types in humans. And this can mean larger jumps on a short time scale that can lead to things that are hard to predict and evolution that we might not kind of see coming. Of course, trans things like transmissibility in SARS-CoV-2 are likely to reach a peak at some point. It, it can't be infinitely transmissible, but in particular, we don't necessarily know if it has used up all of its tricks for getting around existing immunity or whether there might still be big jumps in the future. So what does all of this mean? 
For me, one of the big takeaway messages from where we are right now in the pandemic is to keep in mind that it has thrown the unexpected at us so many times. We've heard so many times in the past that the pandemic is over or that there won't be any variants or that there won't be any new variants. And we've been wrong each time so far. Is, is SARS-CoV-2 endemic? Right now, I think many scientists would agree that it's not because endemic means predictable and stable. And we're still seeing unpredictable surges it, caused by new variants and caused by other factors around the world with SARS-CoV-2. But I think a lot of scientists, myself included, do believe that we'll get there. But the question is how long and bumpy is that road? And a lot of this is determined by factors about how the virus might evolve and re respond to the selection pressures that we're putting on it through immunity, through restrictions, and whether it still has a lot of room to make big jumps or whether it will soon settle down into a more stable pattern where it perhaps changes just a little bit on the outside so it can reinfect people in perhaps a seasonal way. But whether that is six months from now or whether that's two years from now, we just don't have the expertise. We don't have the knowledge. We've never watched a virus go from pandemic to endemic on a global scale with vaccines and immunity the way we have it right now, with the clear detail we have. So we just don't have a lot to draw on. And the other thing I, like the other thing I think is really important to keep in mind is that real world success is very complex. So what is true, what was true six months ago, isn't true today and may not be true in six months. In particular, the pandemic is ever evolving. And this is going to be even more true in the future. I already described how Omicron had a very different impact here in Switzerland than in Hong Kong. While many different countries have used different vaccines, have had different success in getting people vaccinated, including in different age groups, and of course have different infection histories. Some countries have had much bigger waves than others. And all of this is going to probably play in the future into how dangerous a variant might be for a different country. So it's unlikely that in the future, a variant will just be of equal concern for everybody but instead that it will have a bigger impact in some countries than others. And very importantly, we need to keep this in mind when we're assessing a variant, not just how dangerous is it here in Switzerland, but how dangerous is it around the world? And how can we as a global community still respond to that? Even if our own personal country might not be affected, how do we make sure we're not leaving anyone behind if a new variant comes that could be dangerous for somewhere in the world? For me, the real takeaway is that as we move forward in the pandemic, still a pandemic, we need to remain flexible and prepared. It's very tempting, I think, for politicians right now to you know, feel very confident saying things like the pandemic is over and we won't need masks, but we need to be careful that we don't back ourselves. We want to go back, and I certainly think there's a good chance we will never go back to just uh, restrictions that we saw. We know a lot more now about getting down. I also don't think we should promise the variant that might need that we go back to some of those um, restrictions we've used in the past and be open with people that they just don't know. So as I said at the beginning, sequencing is, is something that's been really key to the pandemic and that has allowed us to do everything that I just talked about, particularly a lot of our understanding variants like Omicron. And it's allowed us the multiple effective vaccines that we've had to allow us to track how SARS-CoV-2 spread around the world initially in places with with um, more investigation of things like and close transmission. Of course, it's allowed us to learn much more about the mutations of SARS-CoV-2 and how they impact the virus. And finally, again, what we hear so much identifying. But a lot of this, oh, sorry, my, my camera is a uh, gallery. A lot of this is perhaps what those of us who work in phylogenetics would have hoped for. If you'd asked in 2019, you know, we have a pandemic, what can sequencing bring to the table? I think I would have said a lot of these things. So even though it's fantastic you've done them, it, these are exactly what we would have hoped that molecular epidemiology and sequencing could bring in this kind of scenario. But what we might not have envisaged so well is what this would look like or how we really actualize that. And that's what I want to just kind of finish off talking about today. So sequences are the raw material. They are absolutely critical to everything we've done, which I hope I highlighted already. But there's more than just sequencing. And, and the pandemic has changed many things about how we've done science and how we have moved forward our scientific knowledge. For example, during the pandemic, we've largely moved beyond publications. Now, they're still critical, certainly for academics like me. They are, of course, our bread and butter, as always. 
but they're not what is informing real-time response. They come to this. Instead, we are relying on people sharing information as they find it openly through things like Slack channels, through Twitter, seminars like this, through preprints, through GitHub repositories. So those, those publications are still important, but we've seen a revolution in how people are sharing data so that we can have a, a fast pandemic response. And very similarly to that, we've seen a real revolution in how we analyze data and information. So how we're extracting information from our sequences, how we're able to, um, how we're able to make use of what we can see in the sequences we generate. And enabling this is really, really key because it's not just enough that sequences are able to generate their, their own, sorry, that countries are able to generate their own sequences. Yes, that's critical, but also that they can actually use those sequences to learn about their own pandemic. That's a benefit to all of us around the world to have a better idea of how this is working the world over. It's going to be a real issue here. So we, we're, it's wonderful we have so much data, but we have to be careful that we are swimming in it and not drowning in it because downloading huge files and processing the number of samples we get a day is a challenge. Unfortunately, resources for doing this are not equally spread. And of course, part of this, this is why developing new tools and resources is critical and why sharing and collaboration is essential, because it's not just about having the sequences, but also about being able to use them. And so I just want to cover a little bit of a few of the ways of how this has kind of been realized and why we need this full diverse circle and kind of fishing off with why it's really important that we think about not just sequencing going forward, but how we empower use of those sequences. So, of course, I do a lot of variant tracking. Um, that's something I'm really invested in. I'm the, the founder of Covariance, but there's a lot of brilliant tools out there, a lot of websites that break down, for example, variants, um, the, they give real-time information about different variants and how they're spreading, they give resources linking to papers about them and the mutations that they carry. I showed some fantastic um, uh, graphics from outbreak.info on BA1 and BA2 a few slides ago, and many people rely on these tools for real-time updates. Of course, the general public but also government and healthcare agencies and scientists, because we don't all have time to rerun these kinds of analyses every day. It wouldn't be efficient. It's a waste of resources um, for us each to have to discover everything from scratch every day. So we, we're really lucky to have resources like these that can help provide that information in a more efficient manner. But even to do something like tracking and identifying variants, both for tools like this, but also on a local scale, requires a lot of other things and a lot of other tools. So for example, we have tools that allow, that have been developed that allow us to do things like phylogenetic analyses, that allow us to look at sequences and where they exist in existing trees, and allow us to do things like take a quick look at samples for their quality control and assign a lineage or a clay to them. We also have amazing developments right now in how to identify what a variant might be. I think the Pango group is an excellent example of this. They've been incredibly successful. They have a completely open GitHub where anyone can open an issue and list sequences that they think might be of interest or of concern to see if they need a Pango designation. And all of this happens out in the open for other scientists to discuss and to investigate or for people to just learn from how these things are designated, look back in history and see what caused a particular lineage to get a name or not. And not only just, um, just view that, but also to learn from that, perhaps to just to notice sequences in their own data set that might be concerning and worth more attention. And of course, on top of this, resources that build on other people's work. So as I said, it's very important that in this pandemic, we aren't starting from scratch. It's not efficient and it's also not helpful. We all have different expertises. And so there's been also a wonderful growth of sites that just share information. For example, locations in the SARS-CoV genome that are known to be um, somewhat unreliable, perhaps like a primer site that you might want to mask in an analysis. Basic trees that are available that show a SARS-CoV-2 phylogeny in various different ways. So this can be a starting point if you don't want to, if you don't need to start with your making your own phylogenetic tree. And lists of sequences that are bad or are duplicate that you can use to remove these from an analysis so you don't have to rediscover this yourself. So the bottom line is, of course, um, we, we don't want to have to rediscover or repeat work individually, and we want to have choices about the methods that we use. We don't want to be put in one box where we only have one choice of what to use, but rather have a diverse set of tools so that we can pick and choose for whatever the analysis is that is important to us or our region or our country. And of course, everyone, same data set scientists, 
they'll come up with a hundred different questions. And even if you tell them the same question, they'll come up with a hundred different answers to the question or a hundred different ways to answer that question. And this is a strength. Everyone has different analysis questions and different needs, but this can be something that we take advantage of if we can empower everyone to address those questions equally. So we can build on the fact that we have different strengths, we have different expertise, we have different backgrounds, and we have different perspectives based on our experiences, our, our scientific training, and what we see in our communities around us, what we need. And if we can combine this with the ability to share what we can then find, if we can do our own analysis, find our own answers, we can share those and not only get, of course, the recognition for doing that work, but help everyone else benefit from sharing what we've learned with our unique strengths and our unique perspectives. So to me, it's really a reminder that in a world of diverse pathogens, we need diverse tools and approaches in order to enable everyone's analyses. And this, of course, works best when this happens globally, allowing everyone to do their own surveillance and to share their results and get credit for what they have discovered. And for me, it's really important that this is something we've seen develop very strongly in the pandemic. But it's something we shouldn't take for granted, because as the pandemic starts to fade from view, many of these tools may not be maintained. That's always a challenge when making software, um, in particularly in an academic environment. And a lot of it may drop off. And how do we continue to write tools? How do we continue to do this analysis as the pandemic fades or that these questions and how we answer these questions do not fade out? Now, if you know, there's the Next Strain team. And so I have to give a little plug here for Next Strain. But this is something that I feel very strongly about because it's somewhere that something that Next Strain and I define up in my personal views and the Next Strain views that our key purpose is to help enable others do their analyses. This is something we're really committed to at Next Strain. And we provide this open source software that allows researchers to, researchers to do custom biogenetic analyses. At the start of the pandemic, we set up a specific workflow workflow for SARS-CoV-2, and we've really tried to reach out to the community. It's important to us that this is a two-way conversation, that we can um, have give people access to this and learn about what we could do at NextStrain to make that analysis easier, more accessible, and more useful for the questions that they're trying to answer. So we offer things like tutorials and weekly office hours, and as I said, community interaction and feedback is really critical to the, all of the community. And we're really grateful. I mean, it's been amazing that hundreds of labs worldwide, we have a little map online. You can see all of the analyses that people are running. And there's many more than this. Um, we just don't add data sets unless people ask, because of course, not everything necessarily wants to be publicly listed. But we do need to keep in mind that, of course, as I said, it's not just sequence, but sequencing is critical. If we look at SARS cov 2 sequences um, per capita, it's not evenly distributed around the world. Even now, this late in the pandemic, we haven't seen equal efforts to get sequencing technology out there. That alone can be a huge barrier. Change, make sure reagents are available so that that sequencing can happen. And this means we don't have an even picture of what's happened in the pandemic. And this is not just something that will impact us for SARS-CoV-2, because actually a lot of countries have done amazing. They have generated more sequences for SARS-CoV-2 than anything else. And this is something that will feed off in the future. Can we invest in sequencing when we get that country so that they can really do the sequencing that matters for them? It isn't just something for SARS-CoV-2. This is something that they can then use to investigate sequencing for whatever pathogens are endemic or that are threatening their community. And of course, if another pathogen, if another pandemic happens in the future, it means that country will immediately be able to spawn, not only locally, but contributing to a global picture. So it's a long-term investment that's really worth making. The picture is even more stark. So I worked on a terror gate for the pandemic, and I hope very much to it soon. But this is the picture of all of the BP1 sequences that are over 300 bases long that we have um, around the world. And you can see just kind of different that picture is, how divided it is. Now, D68, unfortunately, we don't know a lot about how it is spread worldwide, but particularly in North America and Europe, if we look for titers against it in adults, we find them in over 98% of adults. So it seems to circulate very widely and primarily infect children. Thankfully, it's not so dangerous. It mostly just causes mild flu-like or cold-like syndrome symptoms, but we have very little information about how it circulates. We know it's a seasonal virus. We know it has different yearly patterns in countries, but we don't have enough data to get a good picture of how it's in other countries, whether it's causing more disease per 
burden in some places, or whether we see kind of seasonal and, and regional um, uh, uh, places where it's moving between from different seasons and different years. So there are unfortunately many viruses that have similar pictures where we just don't have good views. So as we move forward, as the pandemic comes to an end, we have to think to ourselves, you know, how do we empower appropriate surveillance? As I said, this is something that won't just benefit the current pandemic, though of course that is a plus, but it also will benefit going forward to learn about pathogens that impact that country and very importantly, endemic diseases the world over. So viruses that have circulated with us for many years that can probably teach us a lot as far as preparing for future pandemics. If we have a better understanding of how human immunity and viruses evolve, how viruses react to um, having to get around that long-term immunity, how they react to different selection pressures, how likely it is that viruses can cause illness if they generally are a milder virus, but every now and then they can make changes that perhaps make them more severe. Does this happen? How often does this happen? These are a lot of questions we don't have the answer to. But in having more sequencing data and more analysis power around the world, we will come to answer to those questions faster. It will help us not only tackle those particular viruses, but leave us better prepared with a wider virus understanding for whatever the next pandemic is. So my takeaway message from the second part of the talk is that, of course, as I said, as I really in the last few slides, sequencing is critical and we have a lot, long way to go as far as making sure we have equitable access worldwide to sequencing, but it's also critical in how we use them. So it's also critical to put any and resources in to empowering resource researchers so that they not only own their own sequences, but they can analyze their own data and answer the questions that matter to them in their own setting and get the recognition for doing that. And it's as part of that about how we empower better and diverse tool development. People have choices about the tool they use, then the appropriate tool available we have to reinvent the wheel every few years. So we maintain good tools. So, you know, tools like Nextrain are lucky. We've been around for a while. We're fairly confident we'll be around in the future. But for a lot of tools, that's it's, it's a lot harder to stick around, a lot harder to get funding. And we don't want just Nextrain to be there. We want a diverse tool set that Nextrain is part of that allows people to answer questions in complicated ways. Because of course, there's many steps in analysis and we want to make sure that those tools are there to help empower researchers to do their analysis. So with that, I would like to thank, of course, the many, many people in this pandemic that have done sequence generating, tool development, data analysts and researchers, the wonderful people on the NextRain team that I've had the pleasure of being part of during this pandemic, and of course, my current group at the University of Bern, and of course, all of you for listening. And with that, I'm really happy to take questions and start a discussion. Thank you so much for listening. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Holdcraft, for that very insightful presentation. So we've got questions on the question and answer panel, and then some of them on the chat box. And I'll just pick up a few of them. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, we have the first one from uh, Dr. Sophonia Skifler, who's asking, um, how do you see the standardization or, or semi-standardization of the analysis tools? So I do think that this is something really important. So this is something that is particularly when you, if you want to use different tools um, together, then just getting data from one, you know, one tool might put out this data format that assumes this reference sequence or uses this numbering or in this file type and then into another tool. It can make these tools a lot less easy to use. That's one of the things that we tried to do with NextRain is that all of our commands are chainable. So one output should very easily go into the next step. Of course, I'm not going to claim that it's perfect, but resources like Phage, um, this is a recent group that was set up just before the pandemic and has done a lot for standardizing, for example, the metadata and the format for uploading sequences. They also have worked on standardizing things like what data formats people should use, what file types should be standard. And of course, you will never get everyone on board, but the easier that we, the easier that we make it for tools to take each other's inputs and outputs, the easier that it will be for people to have more choice in, in choosing whatever tool they want. So I do think that there there really is a place alongside, you know, independent tool development. We're trying to make sure that we're working to some kinds of standards so that our tools are actually interoperable. All right. So thanks for that. So another question from uh, Gerard Mboa. He's asking, does having different variants of concern emerging from different sections of the tree mean that we have different pressures driving the SARS-CoV-2 viral evolution? And if so, do you have any examples of such pressures? Yeah, so that's a, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, so th that's a great question. And, and I, I think that it's hard to say for sure, 
Um, but in general, I think it's very possible that that this is the case. So in particular, you know, with, with alpha, it didn't have, that was the first variant of concern. It didn't have a big change in the antigenicity, but it had a big change in transmissibility. And actually for a few of the, the kind of early variants of concern, we saw this, that transmissibility seemed to be the big advantage. And that makes sense because transmissibility, you know, even kind of disregarding most other things, as long as you haven't lost out in, I don't know, your ability to enter cells or something, then this is, this is going to be an advantage. You'll move faster than whoever you're replacing. But now going forward, we've seen more variants that have had changes in um, immune recognition as well. Of course, Omicron really standing out from this crowd. But we saw this earlier with, with variants like beta, which also had some pretty significant antigenic changes. And importantly, a few of these may have come from countries where they'd had larger outbreaks, so where the population immunity might have been higher, and there might be, be more selection pressure to get around that immunity. Of course, now we're in a pretty different phase of the pandemic, where a lot of people around the world have been vaccinated or infected or both. And so a lot of people have immunity. So we might expect now that there's more pressure or more success to be gained from getting around that immunity in some form or fashion. Of course, transmissibility is probably also a good bonus as we saw, you know, Delta BA1, BA2 increasing transmissibility. And so if that can be combined in there as well, we might have variants in the future that are, that are more transmissible still if that's possible. But I think that still makes it hard to know what to expect in the future. You know, a lot of it will depend on the constraints of the virus and how strong those selection pressures are. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, another question from Paul Akinduti in the chat uh, forum, and he's asking, what is the effect of immune profiles of individuals from different racial groups on the mutation of SARS-CoV-2 variants? So that's an interesting question, and, and I, the short answer to that is that I don't know. I don't know if there's been a real investigation on the inherent differences, for example, in people from different racial or different ethnic backgrounds around the world, and the mutations that we might see in response to their immune system for SARS-CoV-2. Off the top of my head, I'm not aware of any, and we might expect that for a fairly uh, novel virus, we may not see too many. I want to be very careful here because there have been some studies that have suggested this, or not even studies may be a strong word. There's certainly been some speculation in the media about, oh, this group of people sees more viruses or this group of people sees more coronaviruses. We have to be very careful because I think, unfortunately, a lot of um, a lot of these are not necessarily based in kind of hard facts, but more speculation. Um, but as far as kind of really good studies that have looked at this at a level that is more scientific, that's interesting, but I, I don't actually know the answer. Okay, so thanks for that. Uh, we have Edward Nelson Kantaka asking uh, talks of the next pandemic. Is it re reasonably possible to predict with a margin of error a time frame for the next pandemic? Uh, that's a hard question. I mean, I think that, so this is, I, I guess I'll give a, a bit of a caveat. This is far from my expertise. I generally, you know, my, my history has been studying viruses that are here. Um, so I'm not an expert in kind of pandemic prediction. I personally would say that it's very hard to predict because we, you know, we're ever changing the world that we live in. And a lot of this, a lot of these kinds of events will be stochastic. I mean, we've seen this even in influenza, for example. We have that beautiful tree I showed you earlier with this lovely stair step. We have a good idea of which lineages at the end might lead to the next um, strain that circulates in a season. But predicting more than this turns out to be really difficult. And one idea behind why it's so difficult is just because it's stochastic. So which flu variant goes to the big conference that then gets shipped all around the world, or which one ends up getting into the classroom from which it infects, you know, a bunch of children who go home and infect, you know, like there's, there is a lot of stochasticity in an, in pandemics and in endemics and even in, you know, normal circulation. And unfortunately, that probably means that the same is true for pandemics as well, that it just, you know, there might be something terrible that jumps into someone, but if they go home and this week, they just don't happen to see anyone, that's it. We just prevented a pandemic and we'll never know it. So for me, I think it's it's hard to predict that. Okay, uh, thanks for that. And then you've got Sikulila Mao asking, given the disparity of the level of vaccination, what do you think the next successful variant could look like? This is a tough question. And I think that this is something that is very hard to predict um, because we've seen how the variants so far have been, have not necessarily been what we predicted. And I think, of course, Omicron is really the highlight of this. No one saw Omicron coming. It, it really did come out of left field. And to me, that's a reminder that we don't necessarily know what tricks might be up the, up this kind of sleeve of the, of the, of the virus. But 
to me, it really drives home the point that we need to be prepared that different variants can have different effects in different populations. Because as as Oscar said, you know, vaccine coverage is very different around the world, and so is how many people have been infected. So is what people have been infected with. You know, in some regions, people mostly had Delta. In other regions, maybe it was mostly beta or gamma or mu. And so that, of course, also means that your immune landscape will be slightly different from another person. Or maybe you, you were only infected or infected and then vaccinated. You know, all of this will change what your personal immunity looks like and, it, and may affect, you know, your whole region or your whole country or your whole continent. And so I do think it is an important reminder that with all of this heterogene growing heterogeneity in what our immune landscape looks like, we have to keep in mind that it's not just about what a variant might mean in my country, but what it might mean in also people with different immune backgrounds, having had different vaccines from different manufacturers, you know, all of these different things need to be taken into account. And we might have one variant that's doing very well in you know, this part of the world and another variant that's doing well in this part of the world. They could be circulating at the same time if they're able to find different niches. And I, I think it's hard to predict the probability of that, but it's something that we need to be prepared to react to if it happens. Okay, um, uh, thanks for that. And then uh, we've got uh, Sarah Downs asking, are these same sources for visualization and repository in place for other pathogens? So for repositories, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit different. So for GIFAID, where a lot of the SARS-CoV-2 sequences are, they do influenza, they do SARS-CoV-2, and I think they do RSV now, but they don't generally do, you know, if you come along with random virus, they, they aren't. You know, they, they don't just take every, every virus. Um, but for on GenBank, you can find basically everything. I mean, you can put anything on GenBank. Um, and so there, there is a lot of different viruses that are available. And you can access a lot of those through Viper, V-I-P-R, which is like a virus database uh, tool that sits on top of GenBank. It can help you narrow down if you're looking for a specific virus. For visualizations, a lot of these, or, or just tools in general, a lot of these are, are more generic. I'd say the one divider is whether they can handle viruses and bacteria. Bacteria, of course, are enormous. Um, and so not all software handles bacteria the same way or the file types that are associated with bacteria. But a lot of these software tools are fairly generic and can handle a lot of viruses. Certainly at NextStrain, we started out with influenza and then we expanded. We've done um, Zika, we've done Ebola, we've done mumps, we've done measles. I was doing enterovirus in NextStrain before the pandemic and many people have applied it to all sorts of fun things, including actually like fungus, funguses and bacteria. So a lot of these tools um, are able, or I know some tools right now that were developed for SARS-CoV-2 and they're now trying to expand into being able to handle other viruses or other pathogens. So there is a, a pretty diverse tool set out there. Okay, great, uh, thanks for that. And then we have Bamidele Iwalokun asking, is NextTrend Group thinking of developing proteomic tools? like trying to know the effect of mutations on proteins mm. and conformation and functions? Yeah, so that's a good question. And for next strain, no. So next strain, we're really focused on being very good at providing phylogenetic and kind of phylogenetic associated um, analysis, certainly at the moment. I mean, who knows what the future will bring. Um, but certainly for things like protein structure, this is really out, out with the or expertise of the next strain team. And even though the mutations that we see on the tree can feed into these kinds of analyses, I don't, I think it would be kind of apart from our main mission to look at this directly. But certainly what we hope is that things like what we develop with next strain. So for example, in our open trees. So if you look at our open builds, these are made with GenBank data. And that means that they're entirely available. You can download the tree, the mutations, the sequences, everything. And this can be a really useful starting point if you want to then do this kind of proteomics analysis and use this data to look for the mutations, how frequent they are, where they are in the tree. And then hopefully other people that are more brilliant with structure than we are can do this kind of analysis more effectively, perhaps. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have Esther Kanduma asking, I think still related to a previous question, uh, the number of cases are with few in the African populations compared to others. Is there any genetic evidence to explain these differences? Sorry, could you just repeat the beginning again? It cut out a little bit. So the number of cases are way few in African populations compared to others. Is there any genetic evidence to explain these differences? Yeah, so again, this is a tough question because it's very hard to separate out the very different pandemic um, like 
patterns we've seen around the world from things like ethnic differences. So we know that there are, of course, genetic differences between people based on race and ethnicity, but we also know that there, you know, these are correlated very strongly with things like socio-demographic differences and differences in, you know, how households are organized or when the school years run or season seasonality. And it can be very difficult to separate these things out. That doesn't mean that you can't do that analysis. I'm not aware of data that's looked into this. That doesn't mean that it hasn't been done. But again, I would be wary, I'd be very, very careful reading analyses that, that claim to look at this because you have to be very careful to control for the many, many confounding effects that come with when you start dividing groups into kind of you know racial and ethnic backgrounds. You're also often dividing them, you know, geopolitically, economically, geographically. So it's, it can be hard to disentangle those things. I'll take the last question now in the interest of time. We've got anonymous user asking, uh, with the different levels of immunities and the adherence to prevention of SARS-CoV-2, do you foresee the virus mutating to more virulent strains than the latter? I mean, I, again, I think this is a, this is a uh, difficult question to answer, but I think it's possible. For me, I think the big question is, uh, you know, there will be kind of a peak where the virus, you know, it, it can't become more transmissible on an infinite scale. There will be a, a limit on how transmissible it can be, particularly without incurring some other trade-offs that might overall make it less fit. And what we don't know is, is, is Omicron BA2, let's say, is that the most transmissible it can get? Or are there other ways that it can up that transmissibility even more? If there are, I think we probably can't expect that it will exploit those because being transmissible gives you an advantage. So we can expect that, I mean, all else being equal, being transmissible is a good thing for the virus. What we don't know is, has it kind of run out of options? Is it that it can't really get more transmissible, in which case we wouldn't expect to see this. I think that in the longer term, it'll be more about antigenic differences, about getting around that immunity and what that means in different places, as I already said, and kind of over time scales. You know, immunity we know wanes, um, but many of us have had multiple exposures or multiple um, vaccines at this point, or both. And so that immunity is probably, you know, a bit better than if we just all had had one vaccine or one infection, for example. So that I think is going to be one of the bigger determinants in the long, long term, as far as how quickly we get to things like endemicity um, and how much it can get around our immunity. But in the short term, I think it's really a question of can the virus be more transmissible? And if it can, it, it probably will at some point. But maybe maybe it's done the best it can, and it, and it we won't see something more transmissible just because it can't. <laughs> All right. So I think with that, I think in the interest of time, we've got only one minute remaining. I'd really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Holdcraft, for that very wonderful presentation. I think you can see from the comments in the participation panel. Uh, so we've come to the end of our webinar. Web the next webinar will be on the 13th of April and will be delivered by Professor Christian Happy of Redeemers University in Nigeria and Professor Trevor Bradford at the University of Washington. So on behalf of Africa CDC Pathogen Genomics Initiative, I take this opportunity to thank you very much for joining us today and wish you a lovely rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great presentation and wonderful questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Have a great day as well. Thank you.